Hi, and welcome back to our weekly Orboot Hack sessions, where we work on firmware for the RISC V platform currently, and especially for the Vision 5 single board computer uh, powered by a JH7100 SOC. And before we get to that, uh, this time, just like uh, we had it once before, uh, I would like to walk through some uh, news that we have. And you can already see something I have opened here uh, because currently there is some conferences running. Oh, well, one is just uh, about to end soon and another one will be starting very soon. So yeah, let's look at what we have right here. So um, this year is a so-called mini-conf or MC for short which is part of the larger Linux Plumbers Conference, which is uh, taking place essentially every year, if I remember correctly, and this time it's uh, happening in Ireland, in Dublin. I'm not there, uh, as you can see, I'm still here in my living room. Um, but yeah, I've been following along a bit, and there are quite some interesting discussions going on uh, around RISC-V, but also around the Rust uh, programming language, because that's also being used in the Linux kernel already. Um, well, or let's say being introduced, there is uh, multiple revisions of the first patches introducing it. Anyway, um, let's have a, a very brief look here, uh, what they have on the RISC-V agenda. So um, these, uh, these uh, talks actually were just happened, uh, they just happened yesterday. Um, and so what you can do is, if you want to follow along again, uh, you can watch the recordings. They are on YouTube uh, right here on the um, channel. So LPC, Linux Plumbers Conference, they uh, have a YouTube channel. I will put the link in the uh, notes below later when I upload the video again to YouTube. Um, yeah, so just for short, uh, there is not too much. So uh, that's also very typical for those mini conferences. It's usually like, you know, six, seven talks or something like that. Um, and then usually some moderation around it. So yeah, we got a uh, introduction here. Uh, in the beginning, as you can see, it's really just uh, five minutes uh, held by Palma Dabbled and Atish Patra. Um, there is, uh, if you uh, follow the mailing lists, uh, from the Linux kernel, there is quite a lot that uh, Palma has actually been doing there. Um, I'm not familiar with everything, but I definitely recall the name. So yeah, we, we haven't met in person yet, but um, yeah, uh, definitely uh, famous uh, for uh, doing RISC-V things in the Linux kernel. Um, it seems that there is a bit of a feature talk here, but I guess it's uh, more like because it's the second talk just after this year. So these are the slides from the introduction talk actually. Um, so yeah, there is this one talk on hardware capabilities, uh, which could be quite interesting. I haven't seen that one yet. Um, then there is one on RISC-V, ACPI, and UEFI, which we also briefly looked at here uh, in uh, the live stream. Um, then there is something about a kconfig. Uh, kconfig is the Linux kernel configuration. Um, so yeah, it looks like there is uh, some specific configuration bits for SOCs, the software on chips. Uh, the uh, so <laughs> sorry, um, the uh, what's the S again? Uh, system on chips, right? Um, yeah, I haven't seen that one either. Uh, and actually, I haven't seen any of those. I just had a brief look at the last one here. Anyway, there is another one uh, quite interesting on confidential computing. So that's still. Um, not necessarily a completely new topic, but implementation-wise, it's rather recent. So yeah, it's been introduced also a few years back by AMD, for example. So if you know the topic from there, yeah, this might also be very interesting. Um, and then uh, there is something on tuning uh, routines in the kernel. I'm not exactly sure what this is about, but it also sounds very, very interesting. So tuning, especially it's always interesting because we're looking uh, to, you know, having performance in kernel. So, you know, when, whenever you want to run a program or something, um, you don't want the kernel to block you, right? So essentially the whole job of the kernel, uh, you know, is to make way for the application so that they can run very well. And yeah, finally, uh, there is this talk on F-Trace. So yeah, tracing is a very, very nice utility for essentially everything in software. So you know, if you have uh, more or more, uh, or uh, if you have big or more complex systems um, and, you know, you need to debug something and you, what you essentially need to do is you need to follow along a flow. 
and that is what tracing is for so you know like um, some some uh, application framework for example they just allow for uh, hooking into each and every function call so that you can really follow along like step by step um, yeah that's uh, also uh, being talked about here for Linux on Rx5 and yeah I really encourage you to uh, look at the recordings here um, and then there is another uh, piece that I want to briefly look at, which is the uh, Rust MC. So as I told you, Rust is also introduced to the Linux kernel. And so, yeah, they also had quite some uh, topics here. So yeah, this here is um, right below here. We have the schedule again. So this is now the um, Linux Plumbers Conference's own website. Um, it looks a bit different. I just wanted to show the uh, PDF here because it was a bit nicer to read, I think. Um, yeah, so that's why I just uh, zoomed in here. So I haven't seen any of those talks yet either. Uh, they're from like two days ago now. Uh, but I did see one of them actually mostly. Um, and that was this one here. Uh, Linux Rust NVMe Driver Status Update uh, by Andreas Sindborg. And that talk was really amazing. So yeah, the um, designer of the NVMe spec was actually also present there uh, and was um, proposing to write an NVMe driver, you know, for reference and measurements and so on. Um, and he, he essentially said that, uh, you know, the driver as it's currently in, in the Rust version uh, quite exceeded his expectations. So yeah, um, they also did a comparison there, right? So like uh, performance between the C implementation and the Rust implementation. And I think they were like about equal. Um, and given that, you know, Rust gives you all the extra memory safeties and so on, which is something that you would really like to have for drivers. Um, it's like, you know, uh, just, just a perfect example of um, something where, uh, you know, Rust really shines. And yeah, so... Uh, yeah, that was interesting. Now, there is also work being done in GCC. So GCC is the new compiler collection. So what we're doing here is we're using uh, the Rust toolchain from Rust itself, um, which is in, in part using LLVM as a, I think, mainly for linking, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, so yeah, LLVM is uh, also involved there. That's like, <laughs> um, you know, in the, in the world of compilers, essentially we have like GCC on the one end side and then there is LLVM. Um, they have different licenses behind them, but yeah, also they are different implementations. So yeah, quite interesting uh, if, if you're into compilers. Uh, otherwise, I guess it's also um, interesting to see how far uh, this already is. Um, yeah, as you can see, the next talk is also uh, on the Rust compiler, a GCC code gen, so code generator. Like, um, yeah, I guess they also have some intermediate code or something. Uh, but yeah, I haven't seen this either, so it could be interesting to look at. Um, and then there is this here, the general status update of, uh, you know, the Rust for Linux project. So that's like the umbrella project um, around everything uh, considering Rust for the Linux kernel. And yeah, if you recall the name here, uh, Miguel Ojeda is currently the uh, person who is uh, essentially steering the project, I think. Um, yeah, at least uh, he's also writing the uh, emails usually with the uh, patch sets for Linux. Um, yeah, there is uh, two more talks here, which could also be interesting if you're into um, into like CI. There is this uh, kernel testing service. So CI is continuous integration, right? And there is something similar for uh, kernel testing where, you know, the kernel is being uh, compiled, I guess, with different configurations and then, you know, trying to be run with different payloads and with uh, different assertions or something. I, I'm not too sure because I'm not too familiar with it, but yeah, that's the rough direction here. Um, and eventually there is another example of Rust in the kernel uh, with eBPF. So BPF is the Berkeley packet filter. Um, a bit misleading if you ask me. So yeah, it's essentially also uh, a bit of a tracing utility, if you will. Um, yeah, it, it also allows for, you know, looking into the kernel uh, but also for, you know, scripting things up and so on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not too familiar with that again either. Um, but yeah, if it's interesting to you, definitely have a look at that. Um, yeah, so that was uh, Linux Plumbers Conference. 
And now coming up, and that's uh, what I can already announce for next week. There will not be a stream next week because I will be at OSFC, the Open Source Firmware Conference. And I will be talking there, um, well, about Orboot, so the current status of Orboot and how far we are with our implementations there. Um, uh, yeah, I will also have a second talk about another project of mine uh, named Fietka, the firmware editor, if you have heard it. Uh, if not, never mind. Um, anyway, yeah, so I will be there. And since we're talking about uh, firmware here anyway, um, if you haven't heard of the Open Source Firmware Conference, definitely check it out. There are um, archives of the previous runs of the conference. So, uh, you know, we have uh, this year archive where you can look at the previous year, for example, uh, but there is also much more. And the recordings are also online. So in part, I think on YouTube and others are on Vimeo, but I think uh, yeah, the archive will lead you to the respective talks. Yeah, so the website is just osfc.io. So, yeah, so much uh, for links. Um, yeah, um, I, ju I just received an another goodie today, actually, which I can maybe just uh, show very briefly in the camera. So usually you see uh, this little mascot I have here next to my microphone, which is an octopus. And the octopus is also the mascot of Yetka, the firmware editor. Um, and yeah, we uh, just got a few of those plushies here. So yeah, this is, uh, you know, Ferris, the mascot of the Rust programming language. A bit unofficial, if you will. So yeah, the um, core uh, logo is this one here, the Rust logo, which is, you know, a gear with the R in the middle. Um, looks a bit like a gear from a bike, actually. Anyway, I, I don't really know the background of the logo, but yeah, it's quite nice, nice to embed in, you know, various places. And yeah, so it's also on the back of uh, the little Ferris here. Um, yeah, but I don't, I don't think I will uh, mount it somewhere here because I don't know, it's um, already a bit occupied. So yeah, um, but for those people at OSFC, I guess I will bring two of the, those plushies to OSFC. One is already reserved and the other one I will have to see. Anyway, um, so much for that. And now let's get back to our Vision 5 board. So uh, I will uh, get back to the terminal here first because this is what we are mostly working with, right? So yeah, we're uh, implementing here. So yeah, this is my editor running here in the kernel. And so what we already did last time was we did a setup again. Um, so essentially after, you know, we had already removed everything from uh, previous uh, implementations, um, now we are doing another attempt and we're using a new setup. And this setup is now based on, first of all, a bit of a different directory structure. So uh, here you see uh, we have this uh, directory star 5 vision 5 1, because there's going to be a vision 5 2 soon. And now we have the subdirectory BT0. So we're going to have this model where, you know, we have multiple stages. And um, well, in, in our case, it will be just two. And they're both written in Rust, right? So yeah, um, that's for the structure. And now within this directory, we essentially have this one file main.rs, which is just, you know, by convention, the main entry point for Rust. Um, and then we created a few other files, one of them being the build.rs. Uh, build.rs is essentially the instructions for building, um, well, the code here, uh, where, you know, we have a bit of a linker script not too much, and it's mostly copied over from uh, some other project, uh, also from Orboot, so from a different board, uh, and then slightly adjusted. Um, and then, well, we have this here. Uh, I just created this. I call it run.sh. I just scripted up what we did last time. So when we build the code and we need to flash the code and so on, you know, th there are a few steps that we need to run. And eventually we're going to translate this to a make file. Um, so a make file will be just wrapping everything. And underneath we will be running the exact instructions then in Rust again, because you know that's our main language here now. Uh, and we're using the XTAS framework, uh, which, we're, uh, which was what we already uh, set up also last time. Um, but yeah, we haven't really filled it out yet. So yeah, we will get back to that at some point. But for now, we will just deal with this uh, run.rs script. So yeah, um, 
So what we tried to do eventually last time was to just write to the UART, so to the serial port, uh, but we didn't really get something out of it. And so, yeah, I did a few further modifications actually here to our file. If you've, um, you know, followed along on uh, GitHub, you might have seen that I, you know, pushed a few more changes already. Um, actually quite a bunch that I already, uh, you know, copied back over from our previous implementation attempt. Uh, things which we are going to need, uh, which are currently in uh, this code here, uh, commented out, but you know, what you see on GitHub already has it. Anyway, um, so long story short, uh, we have this uh, one main function here, uh, which we just call start, you know, just for simplicity. That could be called something uh, else, but it doesn't really matter for us. Uh, we just call it start. And it's the function that is being called into from uh, other assembly code. But as, actually, this year is the first assembly code that we are running. So, yeah. And so, how did this happen? So, we decided to put this assembly code here in line. Um, but there are a few restrictions to that, right? So, one restriction is, first of all, you see that, you know, essentially, we just have one string after another here. And we don't really have syntax highlighting. So yeah, I would need to teach my editor to get me a syntax highlighting here. Um, but that's actually a bit uh, of a cumbersome task to do. I mean, Vim is nice and scriptable. And in fact, this here is NeoVim. Uh, it should be doable, um, but yeah, it's not really uh, the essence of what we want to do here anyway. So yeah, I'm not wasting my time on that. Instead, uh, I'm going to do something a bit different and you can already see this extra file here. Um, I just write another uh, file, which we just call start.s. You know, same name as the start function here. And then we will just include the file in our code um, using this here, the global asm macro. So with global asm, you can just say include stir, and then you would just pull code out of an assembly file and that will then be just interpreted. So, you know, essentially, just as if you were just writing a very, very long string here. Um, yeah, so essentially uh, what we did below there. And now why am I doing this? Um, well, this down here could already be sufficient. I also want to be able to use jump marks, for example. So if you uh, look at this down here, um, well, when you, uh, you know, when you have these labels here, like uh, one colon, one colon, uh, you can also jump back to those. Uh, but yeah, if you give them names, for example, you already start getting warnings from Rust and that, you know, seems a bit weird and yeah. I will have to see a bit if I want to have everything in here or, you know, still parts here, because on the other hand, on the upside again, uh, what we can do now, because we are on the Rust side, uh, we can also use part of the code that we actually wrote in Rust or, well, use some of the definitions that we have here, like the stack setup here, for example, right? So, yeah, it, this is where we're including symbols. And again, this year, uh, the symbol main is a function that is also being defined again here in the Rust code. So, yeah, this is what we have now. And now let's see how things come together again. So first of all, um, this here is now commented out and the code as it currently is actually works. So I can verify that by, you know, just showing you. Um, but yeah, before we do that, I uh, briefly want to look at the setup here. So we have this build.rs, right? So in build.rs, um, we specify uh, the sections that we have in our binary. So, yeah, if we look at the um, if we look at the opt dump, we will recognize things from here. Um, but there is also something that we define, and that is the entry point here. So we say entry, and then we give it a name, and whatever is named here is where the execution should start. So yeah, we. Uh, we have entry boot here. You can see my Vimoji here. So this is my emoji for saying something has been modified. Um, I put this boot thing here uh, into the started S script. So yeah, we will have a, a quick look at that in a bit. 
Um, yeah, and this here, uh, down here is uh, also what you still recall from last time if you've seen it. Um, yeah, where we, you know, just inject uh, what's up here into this uh, intermediate file for the build process, uh, which then serves as the actual linker script. So yeah, nothing too fancy really. Now if we um, look at this uh, start.s, uh, I haven't done much here actually. I just copied over a few things from the previous setup. So uh, this here, um, this is now for the trap handler. I'm not exactly sure yet uh, where this should be defined. Um, yeah, we, we will have to see about that a bit. I mean, if you uh, if, if you look at this, there is this trap entry red and then, you know, it really just returns. Uh, but yeah, we, we will have to see if we need to define something uh, more elaborate there. Uh, because essentially, you know, if we run into problems and if we run into traps at some point, um, we might actually want to have some help for debugging. Anyway, there is also um, this fancy thing up here, which is called debug. And what it's doing is essentially it's just loading one register, which is the UR3 base register, which we uh, also looked at last time. We also have it actually defined here in the Rust code. Um, and then we're just writing characters to that. So yeah, what I tried last time was just writing digits. And I think that was actually part of the problem. I'm not even sure if I uh, got the hex codes right. Anyway, so I just switched to this year what I also um, had for uh, the previous attempt that we did. Uh, you know, where I just uh, put actual, um, you know, actual characters from uh, from the regular alphabet, so letters. And these are the letters B, A, D. Well, and then I'm putting a, a line break here. So both the carriage return and the line feed. And yeah, so for each of them, you know, I just load the character to register and then uh, copy that over to uh, the UR3. And um, yeah, this is how we're doing it. We, we just use SW. So with SW, um, you know, we, we just write to memory. And for writing to memory, we need to have a value in one register and then the target uh, memory address needs to be in another register. And the zero here really just means offset. So yeah, it's offset zero from um, this value, which is, you know, the UR3 uh, register. And now if we, um, if we power on the board, we can actually already use the UART right away. We don't need to do anything, uh, which is nice. But with that one restriction, uh, this is now the UART running at 9600 baud, but we uh, actually want to switch to a higher baud, right? And so what we're doing is we're so we already did this last time and uh, a few times before. Oh, well, not last time, but uh, we, we did it before where we switch from one UART header to another UART header uh, where we have a second uh, UART serial uh, converter attached. And so that way, you know, we can listen at uh, both baud rates. So yeah, we just switch over and then uh, select the higher baud rate and then just continue with the output there. Now, the problem is, Again, that is not too trivial. So it's not just uh, doing this change for the UART, um, but actually you also need to do a bit more. And this more thing is what we're going to try to figure out again today. Um, I already tried this uh, in preparing this uh, here, uh, but it hasn't yet fully worked. And the question is why, because you know we already had it working at some point. Uh, and since I initially just, you know, copied over everything here right after the stream last time, um, yeah, maybe I did something wrong there and we need to recap everything. Um, so yeah, we will see. We want to do this step by step anyway. So yeah, now let's, um, let's get back to uh, the code that we have in Rust now, which is currently excluding this assembly bit that we saw. So when we start here, and mind, so if we now, uh, I'm, I'm saying entry boot, uh, but if that's not defined, it doesn't really matter. It would just start executing at the top here now. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll start with this function because it's the first thing defined and then we'll jump to the main function here. Um, so this code here will be executed and then we will make it into this area where I'm you know, just writing again to the UART. And now when we do this, you will see 
that we do not really get the O, R, E, and so on in this exact order, um, but it will actually look something, uh, you know, a bit funnier. So yeah, let's actually uh, do this now. So we're going to run the script now. The script is going to run cargo build. So cargo build is really just going to build the binary for us. Then we're going to do the opt copy here. That's what we're going to script up in a Rust file at some point, uh, outputting a test.bin file. Then we extend the test.bin file to 1k using the truncate command. And then we use the uh, recovery tool that we also used uh, before. And what we're now going to do is um, we will run this from the, uh, you know, from, from the uh, SRAM where uh, the recovery already ran and then also just continue running from uh, SRAM there. So yeah, what we tried last time was actually writing to flash and running from flash. And so, yeah, I actually, uh, now I remember it. That was actually where we were having trouble. So, yeah, in, instead, of, uh, instead of flashing, we're just going to run from DRAM. And so, yeah, let's see what happens now. So I will say run, and I will power on the board. And so on the top right, you should then start seeing or boot, or boot, or boot. But it's going to be a bit different. So, yeah, let's quickly do this. Okay, and now you can already see it. I just stopped it so that we can now... Uh, scroll back a bit. So what do we see? First of all, um, it looks like all the O's made it to the front somehow. There is one instance where it actually seems to work and it says or boot, well, a, a few times before, you know, and, and then it starts getting a bit weird. Um, but that's okay. That's because, you know, we're really just hammering the register there. We're not doing it in a controlled manner. And so, yeah, weird things start to happen. And here in the beginning, uh, we have uh, a C actually, and that C is coming from the assembly code. So in the assembly code, um, I'm loading one character, uh, which is, uh, should be 43, right? So hex 41 is A, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so yeah, 43 would be the C character then, or C as in, in C here, <laughs> the language. Um, Anyway, so as you can see, this works. Uh, what we're now going to do is, just for comparison, because we also did it last time, let's actually write this to flash now. And so we also have this file here, flash.sh, which is doing the exact same thing, uh, except that it's writing to flash. And I already have this other script here, so I don't need to write the full lengthy command. Um, so yeah, let's do this again. And then we should see that, well, this here won't work. Um, so what we would need to do now is we uh, need to load a recovery loader first. This recovery loader is going to load another binary that we send it over and write it to flash again. And then we hit the reset button. And when we say uh, when we hit reset, um, we, we won't see anything up here. So yeah, let's do that now. So the process is done. Okay. Now I will hit the reset button. And as you can see, there is nothing in the top right. Okay. So what I will do now is um, I will now include the assembly part that we just talked about. So uh, that would be this year, global asm. And just uh, to remember again, this year is the few additional things that we do here now. We also have this here, which is saying debug, which we could use. So um, yeah, we, we could jump to that at some point for debugging. I just defined that so that we can use it. Um, yeah, otherwise it's really just those few instructions being executed. So yeah, let's see again. So uh, we're going to build again and flash again. But before we do this, um, let's actually have a quick look at the obj dump because the obj dump will now tell us uh, what we got out of everything. So. We're going to say RIST 564 uh, Linux GNU obj dump, and we're going to give it uh, the capital D character. So D is for disassembly. And now we're going to disassemble uh, the binary that we just built. So that would be in target RIST 5 something debug. BT0. So BT0 is an ALF file 
And with Opsjump, we can look at the L file now. We just pipe it into less because it's quite some code, right? Okay, so let's see what we have here. So here it's saying we're loading the value 67 to T4. And if we, um, you know, are struggling with this now, what is 67? Well, it's just the decimal representation actually of the uh, character that we're putting there. So yeah, the hex value would be 43, right? Uh, now it's saying we're loading to register five, um, something that looks a bit short, uh, but why is that? This is because the order here is actually reversed. So um, this here is little endian, which means that the least significant byte um, is actually, uh, hang on, um, is it little endian? It, it should be little endian. Uh, does it even say that somewhere here? I don't know. Anyway, um, so yeah, the byte order is such that uh, this here is actually, um, <laughs> this here is actually the last value. I don't know why there is a zero here. It's a bit weird. So yeah, it, sh it should be really like, so it, it's not reverse. Sorry, I need to correct myself. It's not reverse. It just looks like something is being omitted here, which is a bit weird because we got the full value here. Um, maybe that's a bug in Opsdump. Maybe that is by design. I'm not sure. Um, well, okay, let, let's, let's do the following just very, very briefly. Let's look instead of the Opsdump, let's look at the, uh, at the translated binary, so uh, what we did with opt copy, where we really just have the full binary that is uh, eventually running. So if we look at that, um, we see this here. So there is four, four, one, two. Now here you actually see the reverse byte order. So the 12th is actually before four, four. And it looks like because it might be because we have compressed instructions. It, it could be, I'm not exactly sure now. Um, it could be that because of that, the uh, leading zeros are actually omitted, um, but we're doing a 32 bit load instruction. So it knows that there is, uh, you know, empty uh, void before <laughs> the 1244. Anyway, yeah, let's get back at the option. I don't know why it's represented this way here. 1244 uh, Oh, it's actually, sorry. Um, the, the zero zero is actually behind that. It's just looking a bit weird. So let's, let's maybe do this here. Let's look at that in comparison. So let's look at, um, let's go to the, sorry, the right directory. Uh, vision five. And let's look at the two in comparison, right? So uh, BT zero here. Okay. So yeah, we, we got this here. Uh, this is now the actual hex dump. And this here is the object dump from the, um, uh, from the uh, L file, right? So below here, we have the uh, eventual binary up here. We have the object dump. And so what we can see here is these four first bytes, they are just like here, except in reverse order, right? So this nine three at the beginning here is at the end here and so on. Now the next instruction here, three seven O F and three seven O F is also what we have here, just in reverse order. And then we have 1244. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting how this happens. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe somebody who is uh, a bit more uh, familiar with the, uh, you know, the assembly representation here uh, can look up why it's looking like this. And maybe there is also a sense behind doing this here and omitting the extra zeros. Anyway, so yeah, what I wanted to show here is this here is indeed the start function that we defined in assembly. Now I've already, um, I have already uh, saved the file again, which will now include the other assembly file. 
So let's just do a cargo build here. And when we do a cargo build again, when we now look at the object dump, um, it will look a bit different. And what happens is, well, first of all, we got this debug function here at the beginning, right? And that would print us B, A, D, and then our line breaks, then jump over to this boot part and eventually jump into start. And from start, we just continue with, uh, you know, what we already had before. So this is what we saw earlier. Um, yeah. Now let's see when we run this. I actually suspect that we still, for some reason, start here. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how this works, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I would expect actually that you, when you, you know, when you say start, uh, uh, when, when you say entry, and this is the function to start with, um, that it also behaves like that. But yeah, I don't know, it's the linker script. Uh, essentially, it's really just boilerplate for us anyway. So yeah, I'd, I also don't want to spend too much time on that again now. Okay, so now let's see, first of all, when we run this again, um, we should actually get the same output as before, uh, but it might be that we see bad in this instance. And okay, I already stopped execution again. Let's scroll back. And yeah, indeed, we do see BAD from the debug function that we have. Okay, I'm not sure why this is happening, but it's good to know that it's happening. So now what I want to do is, uh, just for comparison, I also want to flash this and see if this will run now because I wasn't sure, um, you know, if, if some extra setup uh, in the as uh, assembly code was actually necessary for this to start from the beginning. Oh, hello, um, Nemortis. So yeah, welcome to the chat here. So yeah, I'm reading comments here now. Uh, is the code available somewhere? It doesn't seem to be on your GitHub. Um, it is actually on my GitHub, so I uh, yeah I have uh, two GitHub accounts to be honest. So one is uh, like my nickname here on Twitch, but um, that is not uh, what I'm using on GitHub mainly. Uh, on GitHub I'm Orange CMS. So let's have a quick look here. Uh, and actually um, there is a, a pull request on the Orbit project. So if you uh, look at GitHub.com/orbit/pulls, like the pull requests. There is this work in progress thing here called Orboot Vision 5 uh, 1 Start Over. Um, that's what we started last time. And here you see uh, the pull request is coming from my uh, account Orange CMS here. Yeah, for historical reasons, this is the account I'm using on GitHub. So, yeah, but yeah, best uh, just look at uh, Orboot and then the pull requests. And yeah, this is the one that we're talking about here right now. All right. And with that, um, yeah, back to this here. So, yeah, now we have written this to Flash again. Let's see what happens when we reset. And lo and behold, um, we still do not see anything. So, what we're going to do is. Uh, you got it. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome. No worries. So what we're going to do is we will just, you know, just load to SRAM all the time and just uh, start running from there. Um, because with that, we already have a working setup now, right? And so we can just go forward. Uh, and at some point we can uh, get back to the details of why it doesn't run from flash. So um, it, maybe it might actually work after we comment out a few uh, other bits that I found somewhere. So yeah, um, this here sort of works. We don't see this emoji for some reason. Um, I guess the reason is, you know, because we're just hammering the register and behind the emoji is actually more than just one byte. So uh, yeah, that, that really doesn't work like that anyway. So <laughs> currently we're just, um, we're just writing one single value as a U32. But uh, yeah, I guess that just doesn't work. I think this should be four bytes, but yeah, I think we actually need to split this up into each and every individual byte. Um, yeah, but we, we will get back to that at some point later. So yeah, um, now what I want to get to is what we already had in the previous code. And you can see I already prepared this file. I haven't yet mentioned it. It's called init.rs. And what I put into init.rs is essentially a collection 
of everything that we already had before. Uh, but I've, you know, just put everything in one file now uh, and shrunk it down a bit. And um, why did I do that? Well, because we had tons of things uh, defined, uh, which were just, you know, from seemingly generated header files, translated, you know, just one by one to Rust files. And so if you look at also the current code, it's... Um, it's really not too nice to read and you know some functions might be a bit confusing anyway so yeah let's have a look at the init file now i will switch off the board in the meantime so what do we have here so first of all let's go to the very beginning because we're in the middle of the file somewhere um and i'm sorry this here is a bit hard to read and it's hard to read because those are all unused uh definitions so what it's starting with is the definitions for the uart so uh, the base register for UR3, uh, the transmit holding register, and so on. You now all the registers uh, which are uh, in the UART. Now there's a function which is called serial out, but it's actually not outputting to a serial port. Um, it's just wrapping the write volatile function and it's wrapping the unsafe part. So essentially this is making um, it possible to you know just uh, write serial out instead of writing uh, write volatile and unsafe around it. So yeah, it, it just looks a bit shorter that way. And the same is uh, also defined again here uh, for reading a value. So yeah, the read volatile function is um, just uh, renamed here to serial in and you know with the unsafe inlined here. Now there is a bunch more uh, constants you find down here. So yeah, in uh, in a UART you have this here, like the line control register, uh, the line status register, the FIFO control, and so on registers. Um, yeah, these are all defined there. And now we have this function uh, UART write, and I essentially have the same function that you already saw in the other file, um, but I changed the definition a bit so that we have. Uh, first of all, a little for loop. Um, and at some point, we would actually need to look at the um, transmit hold register. So this should be uh, the THRE, if I'm not mistaken, and the line status register. Um, yeah, I, I tried it. It hadn't yet really worked fully, uh, but I hope we get to this point where this does work indeed. And now to the fun part of reconfiguring uh, the UART. So as you recall, we have the UART now on the um, debug header and it's running at 9600 baud. So what we want to do is we want to move the UART to the other header. And for doing that, we have a few functions here. So first of all, there is this function, it's called well, this part here is actually uh, the interesting part. IO pad share cell for select. And then we put the six here. And what this essentially does is it's moving the UART from the debug header to the 40 pin header that we have. So that we can, you know, see the output again on the other uh, UART that we have. Uh, but we're now running on a higher baud rate by reconfiguring it this way. So first of all, um, we need to set up the divisor. So yeah, on, on, on the UART, you know, you have a clock there and the clock signal, you know, that, that's the reference signal. And now you would need to uh, divide that clock. Well, you actually see the division here, right? So there is a slash character. <laughs> um, and depending on the baud rate that you need, uh, you need to divide it by a specific value. So this value here, it's really just taken from the C implementation, right? So that's just copied over. And for some reasons, you need to shift it by four. It's just how it is. I guess it's um, I guess it's high enough a number anyway, so that the four last digits are just zero. And yeah, that, I guess that's just how it works. Um, we don't have documentation for that, unfortunately. So yeah, it's, it's really just uh, copied over. So yeah, now we need to um, do this here. Uh, it's it's a bit of, um, let's say, a bit of a ritual. So I've done something similar, um, but with a manual that I could actually follow. Uh, so, you know, that I know a bit how this works now. Um, so 
we need to use the line control register. Uh, here it's called LCR cache. Uh, it doesn't really matter what this here is called now. Uh, we read from this register. Uh, we do a few modifications and what we do is um, we set this one bit here called LCR. So LCR is the, uh, the DLAB, sorry. So DLAB is uh, one of the something latch, I think. Um, whatever. Uh, what it allows for us to do is that we can actually do a configuration. So in the next step, uh, we do that by writing to two other registers again. Um, there is BRDL, I guess this is baud rate, uh, baud rate control or something. I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, it's two registers. There is a high and a low register. So it looks like it's actually eight bit registers. And so here, we need to write one part of the divisor and here we write the other part of the divisor. So yeah, here it's saying divisor and OXFF. And what we can do in Rust is, instead of using the FF mask, so this means, you know, we just preserve the last eight bits, we can also just say as U8. And that way we also get the last bits. So let's do the same here as well. We just say as you ate. Uh-oh, but it's complaining now. Why is it complaining? It's complaining because serial out expects us to give it a 32-bit value. So yeah, we can't really use U8 here. Um, technically we could, but yeah, this is why I'm going to undo this again now. Uh, but just so that, you know, we, we could in fact write this uh, in a different way. Yeah, maybe maybe we will write a bit of a different function. Um, I don't know, let's say, or actually let's do that now. Let's, let's do the following. Instead of using serial out, um, we're going to say, uh, let's call it write u8, right? Uh, we're using uh, snake case here. We're saying write u8. And write u8 will be essentially the same as zero out. Um, and so that it doesn't uh, confuse you, I don't call it anything with zero because it, it's not related to a zero port here. Uh, it, it is in, in a way because we're writing to registers regarding that, but um, that's not what it's about. Uh, it's about the configuration. Those registers are not for output. Uh, so yeah, we will now call this write. write. U8. And so the register is still a 32 bit value, uh, but the val, the value itself is now a U8. And so here we also need to say uh, reg as U8. Okay. Now this here is still marked as unused, and that's because we're not using this function, which is the only f function using that function, you know, but yeah, we're, we're going uh, to get back to that in the main function. So yeah, now we have this function, write u8. Um, we could actually use it also for the other values here, but um, yeah, let's, let's not do that too much right now. Uh, it's also not too important actually. We, I mean, we, we could use it here. For example, we could say write u8. Uh, here it works, um, except those are defined as u32. So what I could do is I could say as u8 here, um, but I guess that only counts now for the last value. So I would need to convert everything uh, like this. It doesn't look that great. So it would work if we just define those here as U8s. So yeah, um, last thing we do is we write a zero to the MDC register. It, it disables flow control. So yeah, we also disable flow control on the other side. Um, so if you, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, these simple UARTs where we just have the two pins for RX, the uh, retrieve thing, and then TX, the transmit. Um, those are only two pins, but um, you could also have hardware flow control, for example, for which you would need a few more pins. Um, 
And technically you could also do this in software, but yeah, we're not doing that. And yeah, here again, I could actually use write u8 and it will be happy. So yeah, here it will just see, okay, zero is a value that fits in a u8, so this will just work. If I wrote a value here, which does not fit in a u8, like let's say 256, which is just, you know, one too much, um, it should complain, right? So yeah, literal out of range for u8. So yeah, we just need to write a zero anyway, so it's fine. Now this here is interesting. It's also, uh, again, just copied over um, whatever, uh, FIFO. So the FIFO uh, abbreviation is for first in, first out. Um, that's essentially when you, you know, you talk about queues. So, you know, uh, when, when you have queues and, you know, you want to uh, put something in a queue, take something out of a queue, there are different strategies that you can use. And this here is, um, you know, what you also know when, uh, you know, when, when people just queue up in general, right? So people would stand in a queue and the first person in the queue would also be the first person whose turn it is and, you know, the other people queuing up would come next. Um, that's essentially a FIFO. Uh, yeah. There is also like LIFO, you know, the last one coming in would be the first one coming out and stuff like that. You, you could just combine it in either way. Anyway, what it means is, you know, that you can just queue things up here. So here again, um, we could actually use the uh, write your 8 function already. So it's a bit less confusing. And now what we need to do is again here, say su8. And again, another serial all we can also use write your 8. Okay, fair enough. It says this the sir inter okay somebody was a bit lazy so this means disable the serial interrupt so yeah if you um if you've done this before with the UART you can operate in different modes usually so you know some people would use interrupts at some point but we're not doing that you know we're just writing to the register and we're done with it um, so uh, this is also sometimes called the CPU mode. Um, so yeah, what, what we do is in, instead of send, uh, setting up interrupt handlers, um, we, we just write to the uh, register for output and then we check whether it has been sent and that check is sometimes also known as polling. So you know, you, you're just asking, hey, uh, has this already been sent? Has this already been sent? And there is a status bit for it. Um, Nemortus writes, I will dig into the Orboot QMU Risk 5 stuff. I think that is something I'm interested in contributing for. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, we also, um, so w we, we just did a bunch of restructuring and we put the uh, QMU uh, implementations into a directory that we call source dot, let's, let's see. Um, source.broken. So in source.broken, uh, there is this directory mainboard and in mainboard we have emulation and then we have the QEMU risk 5 directory. And this here is actually uh, risk 564. So yeah, just so that you know. I guess it would also make sense to rename it at some point because we could also implement risk 532. Um, yeah, just, just for reference. And um, yeah, if you, uh, if you haven't seen the last stream, so please have a look at that because that's where uh, we looked at the setup that needs to be done here, you know, to define the X task setup on the one hand side, um, which we haven't yet filled out fully. And then the uh, board specific setup on the other side, which is what we're currently uh, working a bit more with. All right, so yeah, back to the code. Um, yeah, as you can see, I've uh, rewritten a bit now. Um, this is the last year out that we have. And well, we can actually do this. We can say write you eight. And we can do the same thing as before. We can just take those two and say as you eight, right? And then we can do the same here also. And also say write you eight. I guess I will uh, need to fight a bit with the NeoVim configuration at some point because it's 
I don't know, printing weird stuff at the bottom. All right. So yeah, um, with that done, let's see if it works. Um, so yeah, we will need to say you are init. And now the problem is, if we just do this, um, well, let's, let's actually see what happens. So, oh, we, we forgot one thing. We need to do this here. So uh, we need to actually say you are init. So we say you are init here. We just call the function and then we enter the loop again. And so instead of using the uart write function here, we're also just going to use the implementation from the init file. So I'm removing it from here and we are going to import those functions again from here. So yeah, it, as you can see, I've already prepared, as I said, a bunch of more stuff, um, which is now just unused imports, but never mind that. So what we do is we use the uart init function and then the uart write function from there. And that shall be it. And yeah, so in that sense, we can actually now remove those uh, definitions again here. It's not as, uh, it doesn't need to get in our way here. Okay, so yeah, let's see if that works. Um, so we're gonna say run again. And what do we see? We see bad C, but nothing on the other UART. And that is the core issue we would now need to resolve. So. Yeah, back to the other code. And now let's talk a bit about the other setups that we're doing. Uh, thanks for the pointer rights. No more, just we'll get in touch uh, via the respective PR. Cool, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, welcome to the project actually. All right. So, um, you are in it. I have uh, prepared something. <laughs> um, and this is uh, now a larger function, which I just call init. And what init is doing is including uart init, as you can see highlighted here, uh, but we're also initializing a few other things. And those few other things are, well, the clocks. So uh, on the SLC, we have a bit more than just one clock. Uh, we will come back to that in a bit. Um, then there is one very specific init thing that needs to be done for some reason at this point here. And I'm really just copying that from the previous code. I'm not exactly sure why, but I was saying it's uh, related to illegal instruction exceptions. It's a bit strange uh, because this is also doing something, uh, you know, pad control. I'm not sure. So there is function pad control and there is this other thing where we had IO pad something. Um, I, I'm not sure if they're actually the same thing in a way, we will have to see. Anyway, then we have uh, reset gen in it. I'm not yet exactly sure uh, what that is all about. So yeah, I mean, you, you can reset, you know, specific subsystems of the SOC, I guess. Um, but I don't know what this gen here means. Usually gen is short for something like generate or generator. So it could be that it's for generating reset signals. That would make sense. Um, and now there is a few other things. So yeah, IOPAD init, then comes the UART init, and finally comes something called syscon init. And syscon could be system configuration, maybe. And that's actually the function that you already see up here. So yeah, um, let's do the following now. Uh, I know I have to find the function already here, but I want to have it more visible. So I will just copy this over into the existing code. Um, and now what I want to do, instead of digging too deep into the functions right away, I just want to run them now and just see what happens. Uh, because I already did this last time and then, you know, things became a bit funky. So yeah, you can maybe see this now on the right hand side and I just stopped execution. Um, we did get some output here, um, but it's looking a bit weird. And I don't know yet why. So yeah, let's uh, have a, a closer look now. So yeah, what happened was we, we did get the UART on the second header now, um, but you know, some, something something is just being weird. 
um, there is a few things that we could check now. So first we could check uh, if we actually are on the right board rate. Right? So down here, let's see, it's 11,500. That looks okay. Um, is that also what we uh, what we really are using? Let's maybe let's maybe see what happens when we switch back to the 9600 that we had before. So we say C report setup E and C for 9600. So yeah, let's just run it again and see what we see. So yeah, it doesn't really look too much better. Um, we we still get funky characters. So yeah, let's just switch back again uh, to 11,500. So yeah, now let's have a closer look at uh, what I did here. And as you can see, it's not even complete. So there are a few things which are commented out. So first of all, um, let's ignore the syscon init. Let's start with the first thing, and that would be the clock init. So clock init is defined up here. And this is also, uh, you know, just like the other stuff here, copied over from the previous code. It's calling one function called init core clock. Then it's doing an empty for loop here for I don't know what reason. And then it's calling a fence instruction. So this fence instruction, um, this is a bit specific here now. So you see it's saying asm. So this is a direct assembly here. Um, yeah, it's for, uh, I, I think it's for synchronization or something, uh, but I'm not too sure. So we, um, we also need to get back to that at some point. Uh, we have multiple cores on this SOC, so, well, just two, um, but two can already be enough to mess up the system, right? So imagine you now have the peripherals. The peripherals can be accessed from um, either of the cores. So, yeah, any of the core uh, cores could just execute an instruction, uh, which is doing something fancy. So, yeah, if they both try to uh, configure the UART, for example, that might be actually uh, the problem already. So yeah, we need to see a bit about handling that. Anyway, yeah, the above code here um, is just commented out fully. Uh, it's because it's unused anyway, so or it, it would be just empty. Um, so yeah, after, after clocking it, uh, we're doing this one thing here, which we don't have documentation for. So yeah, except for this one comment. Then we're saying reset gen in it and reset gen in it. Um, well, it's initializing quite a bunch of stuff. And maybe, maybe we actually need to do those here. So yeah, let's, um, let's comment those back in. Um, I think I've tried those last time and that stop things from working, but I'm not too sure. So if you look at this, this is something related to the DSP, the digital signal pro uh, processor, and also DMA, uh, direct memory access. And I'm not too sure if those are um, even necessary at this point here. It sounds all a bit odd, to be honest. So yeah, I would actually expect the UR to work, you know, right away in a sense, but yeah, it's, it's a bit hard to say without uh, full documentation what you really need. So yeah, we're, we're stepping a bit in the dark here. So yeah, let's see what happens now with those commented in. Um, let's just run this again. I have the suspicion that, yeah, as you can see, no more output, right? So this somehow seemed to break things, but then again, uh, <laughs> it was already broken. So yeah, just, uh, let's just keep it that way, sorry. For jumping. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, let's look a bit at the next thing, which is the IO pad in it. And IO pad in it is doing a bunch of these func share calls and eventually also a fence call. So yeah, what happens in func share? Again, this is not documented. This is also just copied over from the uh, previous code that we had in uh, C and that was translated to REST and you know it's it's really just a one-to-one -one copy. Um, there are some values in here and it would be interesting to figure out what those values mean. So yeah, 
maybe we can uh, we can learn about this at some point. And it looks like also this is not really um, it's it's not really necessary to do it the way it's written here. So if you look at uh, no, register 32 SCFG function or something. Um, let's look at the actual implementation. So what it's doing is it's reading in a value, it's applying a mask to it, and then writing back a value. And well, it's applying this mask here, and this mask is not FF, 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 which you could also read as zero, right? So not F, 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 it's just zero. Um, so yeah, if we, if we just change this to and equals zero, and here, well, we, we can remove those unnecessary parentheses, um, then we just or it with V, this really just means the same as just loading this value to the register, right? So we could as well just leave out those previous instructions, if you ask me. Um, we looked at that already in, uh, sorry. We already looked at that in a previous stream and I was you know, wondering why we're doing this. Um, should be this way now. Uh, why we're doing things this complicated. So yeah, let's try this here instead. And I want to see if we still get the odd looking output that we uh, had. Um, I, I just want to see if it still works. And I want to verify this in two steps now. So step number one is, let's see where this was actually used. That was an IOPAD init. What happens if we leave out IOPAD init? When we leave out IOPAD init, do we still see something? So we don't, right? So we need the IO pad in it. Um, but do we see something now when we uh, you know, get it back in? Um, and we have our uh, rewritten version of the function. Well, it looks like we still don't get anything. So I guess I had an error in my, uh, in my thinking when I was uh, saying, well, we could also do it in a bit of a different way. So let's, resto uh, re let's restore this here. Uh, in a few steps. So step number one is we're going to revert this back to this intermediate step that I did. Let's run it again and see if we get something. And well, we do. So what does this tell me? Um, well, Good question, actually. I'm, I'm not even sure what to make out of it, to be honest. So it is a 32-bit register. We're applying a zero mask here. And then we're just writing this value. Oh, and oh, this is also interesting. Now, if you look at the, um, if you look at the other entries above here, so not all the functions look like this. There are also some functions looking a bit different. So here we have hex seven inverted, for example, and hex seven inverted means um, we have uh, actually everything except the last three bits, right? So the last three bits would be zeroed out. So here it actually makes sense to have that mask, for example. Um, interesting. So yeah, but we can do this thing here. So instead of saying or equal, uh, we can also just write NV or V. So that makes it a bit shorter. And we can also here say, instead of end equals zero, uh, we can just read this with end zero. So yeah, this is a bit uh, shorter. Now we don't need the uh, mutation anymore, right? So we don't need to change the value. We just say let n v equals. So yeah, um, yeah. What Rust is saying here is uh, it shouldn't have a snake case name, but it's a generated uh, function name anyway. So let's just not care about this too much. Um, anyway, so what we just did was we shrunk down from uh, four lines and something looking a bit weird uh, to just 
two lines and something that is a bit simpler. So we read in, we zero out all the bits and then we write something which is all the bit zeroed, uh, all the bit zeroed or our value, which should actually be the same as just writing the value. So I'm not sure why that is different. Um, that's a good question actually. Let's maybe look at the zero out function again. So let's see, find like this, right? So we're just writing a U32 or we're using write volatile. So what well, instead we could do, we could just also say write volatile, right? So let's do that. So let's jump back to, um, where were we? This here. So instead of serial out, let's also say here, uh, write volatile. Now we need to say unsafe because it's unsafe to do. Uh, instead of reg, we put in the name of our register. As mute u32, and then we put in the new value. And the new value, well, in the first instance, it would be nb or b. So this should now still be the same as before. It's it's marked right now, but that's really just a line marker for me for the um, ADF column. So yeah, this should run still. Let's see what happens. Yeah, we, we still get fancy things going on. Uh, you see it here at the back. So yeah, that worked. Now I want to see if it also works if we just write V because in, in my thinking it, it should work like that. Yeah, let's clear this maybe to make it a bit clearer. Huh, clearer to make it clearer, get it? Okay, so that still works. Um, so we didn't really need to read this here because it's unused anyway, right? And since that worked, it should also work when we do it down here. So instead of doing this unsafe thing, we could just do this here. So let's do that. Uh, run it again. And we see fancy things going on again. Now let's comment this out. And this is now interesting. So it Depending on the code optimization, it could be that this is still being executed and it might affect uh, what happens next. But you never know. So yeah, let's just remove the line again and see what happens. So when we tried this before, it didn't work, but it could also be that, I don't know, we were just misreading something. No, it still, it still behaves like that. It, interesting. Let's try it again. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> for some reason, um, we need to do this read operation. It doesn't really make any sense to be honest. Now what we can also do is we can just run this and not use the value it returns, right? So we, we just read the value and we just don't do anything with it. Let's see what happens now. Does this still work? It does. Interesting. So yeah, for whatever reason, you can just write to this register. You need to read from the register and then write to it. Um, please don't ask me why. Unfortunately, we don't have documentation for it, but it works. It's odd, but it works. But still, let's leave a comment here. For whatever reason, it appears that writing only works after reading. I.e., if you remove the serial in, it breaks the code. Let's 
hope the compiler does not remove it in optimization. Yeah, it would be a bit of a shame if this um, if this behavior is, is really just as we just noticed, and you know, at some point the Rust compiler decides to uh, you know remove code that is seemingly not needed. I'm not exactly sure um, how the compiler is currently set up to optimize code. It could be that it's not doing anything for optimization, which would be good. Um, otherwise, this is a note to us in the future. Uh, and let's actually write note here. Yeah, it's, it's highlighted, as you can see. Um, there are a few uh, things you can uh, do in code so that you know people get highlighting for it. Like note to do, uh, fix me. Fix me is also a good one. Okay. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because the same could now also be applied in other places, right? And that could shrink down our code again uh, very, very much. And um, what we can also do is we can also try to find more sensible names for those here. Uh, yeah, and actually it's, it's also confusing to have those functions in the first place because we really just execute those two lines and having an extra function for that is, um, I don't know, it's, it's, or it's too odd to have like that. So I would really prefer to have that in line. Um, yeah, I guess that is a bit up to discussion. So if we look at uh, how this is defined here, um, it's called register 32. And this is just syscon iopad control base adder plus hex ad. Um, what is? So this is how it works. Uh, those are 32 bit registers, right? So each register is four bytes in size. So four bytes is the 32 bits. This is why we have steps of four here, like zero, four, eight, well, C, because we're in hex notation, right? And so on. Uh, a few uh, are missing here, but they're not necessary uh, for us currently. And now what we could do instead of saying, okay, this is 32 and so on, we could also give them sensible names, uh, which we could if we knew um, what this was for, but we don't. We only know this is the offset from here. Okay, so, but what else can we do? So we can say, um, first of all, reg adder, we, we know this is the address of a register. Uh, that doesn't add any value to us. It's register 32. So we can just remove the reg adder here. Okay, let's do that for a start. So we just remove all the reg adder. That's absolutely redundant. Um, now this here also has adder in it. Uh, we can just call it base. We, we don't really need to have adder here. Everything here is an address. So yeah, that's a lot of redundancy currently. Now let's al also remove the reg adder in uh, all of those functions here. Um, so we, we just remove reg adder by replacing it with nothing. Excellent. So this is now much easier to read already. And apparently I did something wrong here because, um, so what happened? Uh, I, I guess I messed something up and, uh, oh, huh. yeah, it's uh, because there is actually more than just those uh, defined here. Um, there are a few more defined further below. Okay. So, Yeah, let's maybe just do this actually everywhere in the file so it's at least consistent. Um, so instead of the mark area, I would just do it everywhere. I will re replace all the reg adder with nothing. Did I do it? Oh, the code here is wrong. Okay. So yeah, I, I replace reg adder with nothing in the whole file now. Great. Um, 
Yeah, as you can see, there, there are so many things here which are defined in a similar manner. Uh, yeah, base adder, we just call it base. Yeah, this is this is what happens when you copy around a lot of. Uh, yeah, now now it's uh, now it's giving us a few other warnings, but that's okay. Um, oh, actually, I just removed too much. Uh, okay, let's see. What did I do wrong here? Uh, I think I removed the semicolon where I shouldn't. Hmm. Oh. Okay. Uh, I I guess I just uh, I just did a few things. Okay. Uh, sorry. I uh, pushed a few wrong buttons here. Okay. Great. So yeah, we're redoing a few things here. Undo this. Okay, yeah, so here we're removing reg adder from a bunch more places. And now we remove adder plus here. Okay. But we just want to remove adder. Like this. And also here. Okay. Great. Does the code actually still compile? Let's see. We can always say. Okay, yeah, it does, it does. Let's actually compile this as a work in progress thing and push it. Um, yeah, we, we can still execute it, right? So we can verify that it's still fine. Uh, yeah, it's, it's still making fancy things here. Um, but at least we're getting to this point where, uh, you know, it's slightly, slightly more readable than before. But yeah, let's get back to where we were. So we were in IOPAD init, um, this here, right? And we're, we're still in this realm of writing fancy values to fancy registers, which are not documented. So um, the next thing I want to do here is, uh, I actually want to follow Rust's advice and make this readable again by just uppercasing those. So, yeah, but when I uppercase those, I actually need to do that also further down where I'm using those registers. And as you can see, we're also using a few other registers uh, which have similar names. And I guess you could also do this very easily with um, with Vim or NeoVim, uh, but I don't know how, so I don't do it. Uh, yeah, I will just uppercase those here like this. Um, similarly here. And what we're actually going to do here is we're going to do the same thing as before. So we will just say serial in and serial out the value. And that's it. Because it's much, much easier. And similarly, so here, same thing. We uppercase this, and here we go. And another time, serial in, serial out. And again. So yeah, maybe after doing a bunch of these operations here, uh, we get to this point where we can actually understand the code that we're using here. So yeah, this is a bit of a repetitive task now, but um, yeah, whatever. Uh, at least um, it's a bit less overhead now for us to read, uh, which is always good. 
Um, in fact, we can we can remove this here. Uh, we can we can simplify this part, right? So we can just apply the end mask here by doing this, and here we just do this. So should we also apply the bit mask here? I guess so. Sorry. Yeah. Now we don't need mutability anymore. Right. Much easier. So yeah, here we just zero out the last three bits and then we set the last three bits. So essentially what we could also do is, because we're in Rust land, um, we could probably also say this is a three bit value. I don't know if that is even supported. Um, but that might make it a bit easier for us so we don't need to do this here, right? So this looks like it should really not be necessary. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's, let's not care too much right now. I want to get back to one thing. So um, we were looking at this here, right? And we were saying, okay, this is now uh, register 32, register 33, and so on. Uh, why is it 32 uh, if it's base plus 80? So how do, do we get from 80 to 32? So if we take the size of the register, which is four bytes, um, and we divide 80 by 4. Well, we get 20, right? And hex 20 is exactly decimal 32. So this is how it works. So register, the first register um, is actually this one here, right? So if we were to define register 0, it would be that one. If we define register 1, it would, would be plus 4 because we go in steps of 4. Register 2 would be plus 8 and so on. And so register 32 becomes uh, plus 80 in hex or, well, in, in decimal, it would actually be four times, um, four times uh, 32, right? So hex 80 is four times 32 or eight times 16, actually. So one digit in hex is um, uh, at the uh, second digit is 16, right? So this would be 8 times 16. And 32 is just 2 times 16. So <laughs> instead of 32 by 4, you could also just say 8 by 16. Same value. Okay. Um, now I would also like to remove the uh, register thing here because everything here is a register, right? So yeah, let's also let's also remove the register thing here. Can we actually do this everywhere? I guess so. Let's let's just replace underscore register with nothing in the entire file. Let's do it globally. All right. So yeah, if we were to give those registers better names. Uh, we would then now just go ahead and replace this con IOPAD control 35 with whatever the meaning of this IOPAD control register actually is. Anyway, so yeah, we just shrunk down a lot of unnecessary crap to something that is a, a bit more readable now. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe that will help us in the future. I at least hope so. Um, yeah, there, there is a few other registers uh, like those here where uh, we haven't done this right now, but that's okay. We will just leave this for, uh, you know, some other day. Maybe I will just do it at some point. Um, yeah, I just wanted to enable you to also follow a bit along uh, better here because I think when you just look at this generated code, it doesn't really uh, tell you very much. Now there should be at least a bit of an intuition. And maybe we can also figure out why we would need to read the register first here. So it might be that it's actually only necessary for this one special register. It could be that it's necessary for all the registers. But yeah, again, without documentation, it's really hard to tell. And I don't want to try it with all the registers here. Uh, let's just 
a bit too much, let's say. Um, yeah, now there is another thing which is interesting. So if you uh, look at the functions that are being called here and also the function names now, um, they're saying set syscon reg 32. Okay, so in this instance, it would use this register. IOPAD control 32. And apparently IOPAD is the same as syscon, whatever. Um, now it's SCFG, I guess, system configuration and func share, function share, pad, control. And then here we have a zero, but why is this year func share pad control zero? Well, this year is register 32. So is it that this year is actually the meaning of that register? It's a bit strange. And also, why do we have this order? So why do we say zero, one, two, three, and then seven and six? Does it still work if we put the seven after six? Um, well, there is one way to figure it out. We just try it. And yeah, we, we still get our fancy behavior. We still don't see anything meaningful on the UART, but that's okay. So yeah, we just simplified a lot of stuff. Now the question is, how do we actually get this uh, UART to uh, work properly as we want it to? And so here comes uh, my suspicion again regarding uh, the multi-core setup. So um, for that, I already opened this. Um, I would actually like to look at the uh, original um, started as file that we had, and that was this year. So this started as file looks slightly different, right? So we have this, um, all this fancy extra code here. Uh, in part, there is also, there are also some comments here, right? So like, uh, where is it? There were a few things which were unclear, like what, what, what should we do here? No data section. Um, that is something I guess uh, we might need to uh, look at again. So we have something similar already in the Rust code. Um, clearing the BSS is definitely already in the uh, in the Rust code. Now there's a mark here. It says two. Um, so yeah, we might need to jump to this from some place. I don't know. And here it says jump to enter U-boot. And I don't know where enter U-boot would be, but I guess it's... Oh, it says heck. Huh. Yeah, this here is just spinning around. I don't know, it's, it's like doing nothing, right? So yeah, a bit strange. Um, let's see. So this is .l, wait other heart. Wait for an IPI signal that it's safe to boot. So IPI is again something um, which is now specific to risk five. I forgot what it's for actually, but it's, um, it's a bit related to interrupts, I think. So there is Clint, uh, the core local interrupt stuff. Um, there is this year uh, MIP, that is um, M for uh, you know machine mode, uh, I and P for interrupt pending. Um, I'm not sure what the S is for. I think this is for uh, like when you do hypervisor stuff. I guess it could be, but I'm not too sure at this point. Um, yeah, anyway, we, we should need to we should need to do something about um, multi-core things. So we, we could do this one simple thing. We could just copy this over, see if it works, and if it does, be happy, um, and then m maybe figure out how we can simplify this. Yeah, let's actually do that. Um, let's do another commit again. Uh, let's say simplify, because that's what we just did. Um, and now let's copy over. So this is now from uh, from the previous tree that I had, which is just orboot uh, without anything. Um, orboot source mainboard 
Ah, no, it's not source mainboard, it's source SOC, source uh, star 5, JH7100 star.s. And we copy it to this directory. Okay, let's run. Let's see what happens. Well, it does compile at least. And, well. Let's see again. Well, we don't get any output anymore, except for the C that we're writing to this UART here. Um, okay, so let's do the following. Let's see what is different now. So let's just look at the star.s file, which has now changed in a ton of places. Um, And let's see. So yeah, there should be a jump instruction at some point, which we will need to change. And the jump instruction is what jumps to our um, to our actual start function. I think there is underscore start here. Underscore start. Yes. So we have underscore start. And then at some point there should be another jump. So jump is always, you know, this the simple J thing. And there should now be some J for jumping to our main function. Um, but we don't have that. So let's see. We have enter U-boot. What did enter U-boot mean? Um, It's this heck here. What is wait for other hard? Huh. So where is the part where it would then jump to our main function? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Huh, maybe let's just try jumping to, well, actually we don't want to jump to our main function, but we want to jump to our start function. Uh, let's see. So yeah, this is our start function. This is what we actually want to jump to. Um, where it said enter you, but what did that actually mean in the previous code? So yeah, that's what I have open here, right? So let's see if we can, uh, oh, wait, enter U-boot was defined in here. Ah, ah, look, we have this here. So yeah, we don't just have J for jump, but we also have call for calling into a function, right? Okay, how many calls do we have? We have call start start boot hard. Okay, that should be the main hard. Only hard zero. Okay, and instead of boot, okay, that's it. So instead of boot hard, we are now going to say call start. Okay, let's see if that works. It doesn't. Well, hang on. Um, well, we, we still get the C character, and the C character is actually coming from it's actually coming from here, right? So the C character is what we print here. So this code is definitely being executed. Which is interesting now. So Something here doesn't look right yet. Okay, let's let's do the following. Let's let's first comment out the init stuff here. Let's see if we get the or boot output. Huh. We don't see it. We just see the C. Oh. 
Could it be that something here is messing it up? Okay, let's do the following. Um, for the sake of debugging, uh, let's put a zero mark here. Okay, and then here we just say we just say j zero uh, zero before, and I'm missing a comma. Okay. So this is what I expect to print C, 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 C. Okay, we get C, 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 C. That works. Good. Uh, okay, that's my, that's my bad. Actually, keep it for debugging. Okay, so if we comment this out, we get C, 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 whatever. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's look on the right hand side. Um, do we have something that we can comment out here now that we don't need to do here? So we have m status and mie. Uh, we can comment those out. Um, there is this here. Uh, this CSR write. So the CSR write is a bit special. Um, it's a, here I actually have this common clear feature, disable CSR, and I actually copied that out from the manual. Um, so if, if you recall, we uh, had this issue with figuring out what is actually the right manual for us, and we got a hint um, from uh, Star5 actually. So from the developer support program, you know, we have this uh, forum kind of a Google group thing. Um, you know, where we actually ask for documentation. And so, yeah, we got a reply and now we know what the right manual is. And actually I downloaded it. We had a very similar one already, but it was unfortunately the wrong one. And so this here is the right one. So it's the Sci-5 U70 core complex manual. And this is, um, yeah, page 118, as you, 18, as you can see. Uh, where you know they write something about the boot flow but just like uh, we saw this before um, this is not general reference documentation uh, but that is actually documenting existing code so yeah we're trying to set up our uh, own things here um, yeah you can also see this is referring to something called freedom metal so yeah they they call their uh, course for some reason they call them freedom course whatever so when you read fu uh, the F is for freedom and you, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's like uh, for application processors, they have the U cores and then they have other cores for other stuff. Anyway. Yeah, let's, let's see what else we can do here. So here we actually read the heart ID. So this is like the, you know, the, the uh, specific core that we're running on, the hardware thread in, um, in this instance. And here we're doing something with the BSS and maybe, maybe it should actually always have been like this. Uh, so let's also comment this out. So this is what we also copied from other code, right? Um, let's copy out this whole thing here. Do we have something regarding the stack here? Uh oh. Yeah, that could also be a bit of a problem. Um, yeah, it's it's not too great. It's not too great. Um, now this here on the right hand side, what I copied over. Uh, this also assumes actually to have a bit of a different linker script. So in the linker script, we define the sections. Mm, so yeah, we don't really have BSS end. Uh, it's called something else. I think, I'm not too sure. Let's actually look at the build.rs file again. Hmm. Yeah, we have BSS and SBSS. 
So yeah, S is for start and E is for end, I think. Uh, it could also be that part of that is actually coming from the linker and the compile process at some point, and I'm not really not too familiar with all of that stuff, and it's um, something I would need to read up on. So yeah, I guess that doesn't really lead us further right now. Um, so on the plus side, we did see that we made it into the Rust code because we saw the C being printed, right? Uh, yeah, let's let's maybe do the following. So let's let's also comment this out. Since we also need to comment this out. Let's see if this runs now. No, actually not. And this is now interesting because we don't even see the C character being printed anymore. So let's do this here. Let's see if we now get a lot of C's again. We do, okay. Interesting, interesting. So what else do we need to do? So this is actually here for, it, it says initialize programming language runtime. Yeah. Um, it could be that we still should have this code here. I don't know. Okay, we, we still had the CCC bit uh, this year. So I guess I will need to familiarize myself with uh, linker scripts here a bit more again. And also the whole stack setup thing and so on, which is a bit annoying to be honest. So yeah, we're uh, we're getting a bit lost in assembly here, um, which is actually the part that we don't even really want to do anyway. So we want to keep the assembly very, very small. Okay, so let's do the following. Um, let's end this at this point here. Uh, we're a bit over time anyway. So usually I wanted to stream for like an hour and I don't know, 15 minutes or something. Um, <laughs> we're now 30 minutes uh, past that. And uh, so what we already got is um, we copied over and stripped down a bunch of code from the previous implementation that seemingly sort of works. So we almost got the setup for the UART, um, but we still don't see anything sensible on the UART. And the suspicion, Carney working theory, is that it's related to the multi-core setup and maybe um, maybe we can get that fixed for next time. So yeah, again, next time won't be next week because I will be at OSFC, the Open Source Homework Conference. Um, so yeah, I will see you again in two weeks. And yeah, until then, uh, take care. I will uh, push the changes that we did so far. So yeah, you can uh, look at that again and see you then and take care. Bye.